So today we're going to be talking about, you know, we're going to follow the same format. Um, we've got your um, a couple of head slot updates. Um, I went back into December for one of them because I liked it so much. Um, we're um, we're going to talk about the markets. So here we are, new year, new markets, hopefully. Um, give you a, uh, my feedback on some analyst reports, and then we're going to spend some time talking about the SECURE Act uh, 2.0. So I'm sure you've heard this already. I've seen a lot of things coming our, my way about the updates to uh, the SECURE Act. We're referring to it as SECURE 2.0. Over 100 changes for retirees and and, and about retirement plans and, and uh, financial markets or financial instruments. So um, a lot to digest there. We're just going to touch on a few of them today. Next week on our, our next week's webinar, typically I don't do a webinar on a week like next week because it's following um, a market holiday, Martin Luther King Day. But I'm going to do one. I'm going to. I'm not going to talk about the markets. Maybe some slot updates, but I'm not going to talk about the markets because the markets are going to be closed the day before, and I just can't get the information I need uh, typically. Um, but um, I'm going to. I'm going to spend the entire time, or at least the vast majority of the time next week, talking about Secure 2.0. So um, that should be. Um, a good webinar. I hope that you get a lot out of that. So we're going to touch on some key items today. And by no way is that going to be exhaustive. And we're going to talk, we're going to dig in deeper about it next week. So stay tuned and join us next week. All right, uh, let's talk about some headlines. So uh, we talked about Secure 2.0. So that was gifted to us by Congress at the end of the year. And there are some real gifts for us in there. Um, it came under the um, $1.7 billion Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023. And um, there were over 4,000 pages of that that is um, called, referred to as Secure 2.0. Remember, the Secure Act came to us a couple of years ago, made some significant changes to how we um, how we operate, one of them being changed the required minimum di distribution date from 70 and a half to 72. Secure Act has a lot, Secure Act 2.0 has a lot of other uh, changes that again, we'll review. So that's going to be a hot topic for some time while we kind of digest what's in there and how it's going to affect things. Uh, this week, we, uh, we get the consumer price index numbers on Thursday. So um, I think it's 11 a.m. on Thursday. We're expect, or no, excuse me, 8:30 a.m. on Thursday. We're expected to see those. So obviously, uh, people are expecting uh, the consumer price index, that's inflation, to be lower um, than it has been in the past. Let's hope that's the case, or we're probably going to see a big crash in the markets. But we'll find out what the news is on Thursday. Um, there's a lot of talk about how the Fed's going to handle things, and we'll we'll continue to talk about that over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, what other headlines do we have here? Uh, that's it for today. So let's dive into our slot uh, report mailbag. So let me get ready to share my screen here. All right. So the first is um, this comes from this was the one I reached back in at the end of December for you. So this is from December 22nd. Sarah, my friend Sarah, answered this uh, question. So the 10 year rule and the Roth conversions. Um, and I don't know if that's the first one, but that's the title of this one. So here's the question. And the person writes in, the person's name is Brett. Uh, you see, I'm right here. Ed, I started reading your newsletter and I wondered what you thought of IRS Notice 2022-53. It made sense to me that to the point where it said that the beneficiary of an employee who died after the employee's required beginning date must take the RMD beginning in the first calendar year after the calendar year of the employee's death. So this, again, has to do with inherited IRAs or inherited 401ks, retirement plans. There's a lot of confusion. We get a lot of... Um, email correspondence questions about that. So I like to share those with you. So mostly, you know, to ask a question before you do something that cannot be undone. So now I'm here. But in the end of this notice, they lost me when it says it applies only if the employee died in 2020 or 2021. Seems like it should say 2022 as well. This is of concern to me because I didn't want to take the RMD this year. And my dad died this year, leaving me his IRA in respect of which he had started taking RMDs. So I'm hoping that, you know, Brett didn't send this in on the 22nd and he was able to get an answer timely, but we, we received it on the 22nd, but we'll see what their answer is. So the answer here is, uh, Brett, the IRS issued notice 2022-53 in response to confusion created by the proposed regulations that require annual required minimum distributions during the 10-year period, payout period under the SECURE Act. 
the rule took many by surprise. So the IRS waived the rule for those who inherited in 2020 or 2021. Now, you might remember that the when we first looked at the SECURE Act, when it came out, um, we said, well, it looks like the new um, distribution requirements for inherited IRAs kind of follow what was known as the five-year rule, but now you have to take all distributions by the end of the 10-year rule, the end of 10 years, the 10 years, uh, uh, 10 years after the year of the death, right? So really the 11th year, if you want to think of it that way. And the general consensus was that um, distributions didn't have to be taken until the end of the 10th year. And then the IRS came out with a, an opinion that said um, uh, they do have to take distributions. They have to take RMDs during that 10 year period. So then that kind of spun everybody around, but then the IRS came back and said, "Never mind. We didn't mean to say that you don't have to take distributions until the end of the 10th year. And then they came out with a regulation several months later that said, yes, in fact, you do have to take distributions during that 10 year period under certain circumstances. And it really is simply, as Sarah put it a great way, um, she went in our last training session in um, Las Vegas, she played the the uh, Rolling Stones start me up uh, music as kind of her walk on music. And she said, if it starts, it never stops. So if a person, uh, the the owner of the retirement plan or the IRA who passes away. If he or she had started distributions, then they must continue. They don't stop. If they had not started distributions, there are no distributions required. Everything has to be de depleted by the end of that 10th year. So a really nice, easy way to think about that. So that's, that's kind of a long form of what this uh, section here is talking about. So Sarah goes on to write, and I'm right here. Your situation, though, is a little different. Your dad passed away this year, 2022. So a different rule applies to you in 2022. This is the rule that says the IRA, if the IRA owner died before taking his entire RMD for the year of death, then the beneficiary must take it. Unfortunately, the IRS guidance does not help you with this rule. The 10-year rule will not start for you until next year, the year after your father's death. At that point, hopefully the IRS will have clarified whether RMDs are required during the 10-year period. So um, hopefully Brett got that answer in time. The next one is, hello, I found you via Google search. I converted, and this is a great topic because I'll comment on at the end. I found you via Google search. I converted an inherited IRA, uh, excuse me, an, an IRA investment worth. So let me back up. I converted an IRA investment worth $200,000 to a Roth IRA investment in December of 2021 and pay taxes on that conversion. As you know, markets have been brutal and investments are worth far less. I learned only this week, probably via Google search, that the conversion could be reversed via recharacterization by a deadline, which I believe was October 15th. Or I could apply for a private letter ruling from the IRS. Since October 15th was not so long ago, is there a way to reverse the Roth investment back into the Roth and save on taxes? How many of you believe that you can undo a Roth conversion? Raise your hand for me. Well, maybe my response is slow, but I'm not sure. But maybe you all feel one way. How many of you believe that you cannot do a recharacterization for a Roth conversion? Raise your hand. All right, a lot of hands are going up. And you are all very bright individuals. And I, I hope that's because you're getting this information from me. Yes, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and Sarah, of course, is going to talk about it in her answer, but the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act erased a great tool we had, and that was called recharacterization. Recharacterization allowed us to undo Roth conversions up to October 15th in the year following the year the conversion was done. So in the case of this person who converted in uh, December of 2021 and is his or her uh, account values are down, they could have recharacterized and undid that Roth conversion and did it all over again and saved themselves tax money. We did that for many, many years. The IRS got keen to that um, that little trick and they uh, they took it away from us. So no more, no more, no more. You're all right. And this person did his Google search and this is, I run into this. There are, there are some repeat offenders for sure who who uh, will write in or call in with information and say, Mark, hey, I read this and they've got this much of it right and this much of it wrong. And even if it was reversed, if it was 
this much of it right and this much of it wrong, that's almost always going to jam you up with the IRS. So be really careful. In this case, this person read something about recharacterization. That's something that expired in 2017. Uh, he thought that it still applied today and he could have gotten himself really jammed up. So unfortunately, a missed deadline, Sarah writes, um, is not the problem here as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act 2017. Congress ended recharacterization for conversions in 2018 and later. This remedy is no longer available for unwanted conversions. Really, really great uh, question. And so, so now this, this talks about, I was going to say this to the end after we talked about the SECURE Act, but repetition is good. This is new. Um, uh, this is new legislation. So it, it's, it, we're, is this is something we're going to talk about all throughout the year in 2023, I'm sure. So good to, um, to go over these things. So this is from Ian, Ian Berger. You've met Ian. So the question is, on reading your secure 2.0 information, revised RMD, required minimum distribution to age 73 was mentioned. That's one of the big takeaways from the SECURE Act, SECURE 2.0. Prior to this legislation, 72, age 72 was the RMD age. If this is in effect now in 2023, is it correct that if you, earn, if you turn 72 in 2023, you won't be required to take an RMD in 2023? Based on what I've read, the first RMD for a 72 year old in 2023 will be pushed to age 20, 73 in 2024. Woo. Well, that's a little confusing the way the person wrote it, but that's right. They changed the R&D age. They made it more a little more complex now. So there's different stages and I break it down pretty easily. And we'll talk about that during our financial planning section. But if you turn 72 in, in uh, 2023 and you were planning on having to take your first required minimum distribution, the uh, answer is that you don't have to take it. You don't have to take it now until you turn uh, age 73. That's your required, and actually your required beginning date is when? April 1st of the year after the year you turn 73. And the rules change a little bit as you get older, um, you know, or, you know, depending on when you're born, let's say. So Ian writes back, you are correct. Anyone turning age 72 in 2023 is covered by the new secure 2.0 RMD rules. So that person's first RMD is due the year he turns 73, which is 2024. There is no RMD for 2023. Additionally, the first RMD for 2024 can be delayed until April 1st of 2025. But then there will be two RMDs in 2025, the 2024 RMD and the 2025 RMD due by December 31st, 2025. Really, really great question. And this is another great question, I think. Uh, does Now that we have a new, new RMD rules, how do we calculate those RMDs? Does the IRS, I'm right here, does the IRS uniform lifetime table change for those who will not have to take RMDs until they are 73 years of age? Thanks. This is from Rick. Rick, no, the uniform lifetime table, and you can find that on our website, adelborowealth.com. Go to the slot corner, and it's one of the files that you can download there. Um, no, the uniform lifetime table that became effective in 2022. I don't know how long it had been since it had updated before then, but it had been some time. So this is a new table. I, they won't change this for several years. It's really based on life expectancy. Uh, the new table in 2022 will remain in place. So when someone is required to start taking RMDs in the, in the age 73 year, they would use a 26.5 uh, life expectancy factor. If you have questions about that, um, I can answer those questions what this life expectancy factor is. We've covered it quite a bit in our classes and we've talked about this before. All right, these that's the, uh, the slot uh, group section. I see a question here. So David asks, if you do a conversion at the end of the year, do you have to pay estimated taxes? Well, you probably should, David. Um, so it's, it's obviously different for everybody, but um, there are some safe harbor allowances um, with your um, paying your tax. But if you do it at the end of the year, I always recommend making an estimated payment by the um, estimated payment date, which is January 17th. Is that right? Yeah, a week from today. Um, so, um, so you don't risk any penalties. Good question. Okay. Let's move on here. I'm just arranging my screen so I can see my notes. Okay. All right. Well, let's talk, I'll talk about the markets. First, I'm going to look back at um, the end of the year. So, um, 
I need to adjust my screen size here so I can see a little bit. So the year ending December 30th, 2022, we haven't had a chance to talk about this yet, so we're going to talk about it a bit. The, as you know, we had a bit of a rally at the end of the year, didn't we? And really saved, you know, in, especially in some areas, uh, a lot of loss. Uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average closed the year down 6.86%. Doesn't seem too bad considering where we were, right? Um, I'd have to look at the charts to see how deep we were with the Dow, but it was, uh, it was certainly more than that. The S&P 500, however, was down 18%. So that is really telling. Many people will say, well, you know, if you just invest in the S&P 500, you cover um, the U.S. markets really well. But you can see the difference there and, uh, and why using different indices um, can make sense. So Dow Jones Industrial Average down 6.86%, 6, 6 the S&P 500 down 18.13%. The NASDAQ was down 32.5%. And all the international indices across the board were down 13.74, 19.94, 13.92, 17.96, 18.67. So if you're in the stock market, whether it's U.S. or abroad, in 2022, you are likely down in, uh, for the year in 2022. The five-year numbers still look good, though. Uh, let, me, let me give you some encouraging news. Still, over, the, over five years, the Dow Jones Industrial Average returned 8.37. The S&P 500 returned 9.4. The NASDAQ returned 9.7. The MSCI World X U.S. Index was 2.4. Emerging markets was down 1.10. The um, uh, Europe, Asia, and the Far East was down, was was up 2.12, um, other 5.76, 3.22. So all decent returns, especially the U.S. markets, over a five-year period. Ten-year periods are even better. Dow Jones Industrial Average averaged 12.29 over 10 years. The S&P 500 averaged 12.254, and the Nasdaq 14.50, um, so 14 and a half. The uh, the rest of the world averaged around from 1.7 to 8.5 over that 10 year period. So given this one negative year, um, we still have strong averages over five and 10 year periods. So that's that's encouraging. Now, you heard me talk about this many, many times, but the bond markets, right? There was really people, the 60, 40 portfolio, you have 60 percent in, in stock, 40 percent in bonds or, or vice versa, 40 percent in stock 60% in bonds, you know, if you adjust as you get older to the more safer um, asset classes like bonds, that's what that's what people are taught. Well, the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index, where most of bondholders' assets reside, where your investments reside in bonds, was down 13%. So couple that with stock losses, and now you've got bond losses. These 60-40 uh, portfolios were just devastating. And people had been told for years that this will help sustain you in the long run. And maybe that will be the case, but most people have to draw money out of those portfolios. So I don't want to get it onto my soapbox about, you know, allocating investments based on when you need funds, but um, we're going to, um, you can certainly search the, the webinars that we have on the website. Now that's going to change in the next few months. Those webinars will be gone from our website and they'll be put into courses. Um, if you're a client, you'll have access to those courses. If you're not a client, um, there'll be a membership that you can join to, to access those courses. But um, that's probably not the best way to handle your funds, something as simple as a 60-40 portfolio. Yes, it's worked for many, many years until it didn't. So that bond allocation is really challenging for people. Even the shorter term bonds, one to three years, were down over 3%, almost 4, 3.72%. High yield bonds were down 11.19. Um, but again, the um, other, other than the um, uh, international bonds, that sweet spot where most people invest their money was hit, hard, hit the hardest, uh, down just over 13%. Uh, talking about, uh, the, you know, the big news of 2022 was super high inflation and rocketing interest rates. So let's look at how things, you know, I'm going to share this with you. I'll share this, this chart with you uh, just for reference, because I think this is uh, really telling. All right, so raise your hand for me if you can see what says Invesco Markets Market Review at a glance. Thank you. 
All right, so I'm in the center section here. I'll make this a little larger so we can just see that section. I'm grab my pen. So I am right here. All right, let's look at the growth of the um, Fed funds target growth. So in in 20 the close of 2022, 1230, 2022, we stood at 4.5%. We probably all know that, right? A year prior, it was 0.25. So that's a lot of movement. And I, you know, there's talk right now about the Fed slowing, maybe ratcheting back. Who the heck knows what they're going to do? What, what the Fed can't afford to do is really make another mistake. So I think anything that they do is hopefully going to be well thought out. So this six-month U.S. Treasury, um, is you you know yielding 4.75 percent right now uh, a year ago it was 0.18 percent two-year treasury is 4.43 a 10-year treasury is 3.87 and a year ago they were much lower and as you can see we talked about this a lot but this is showing what we call that inverted yield curve where you get less interest for holding the um, government issued bonds for a longer period of time so that is typically the sign of a recession down the road very soon. Um, and, you know, I believe that if we're being honest and we look back, we've really been in a recession. Just we've been kind of funded ourselves, right, with government funds um, since the pandemic. So I think that's interesting to see because, you know, if you just look at that from from a um, and, you know, tie it in in your head with inflation, um, and what the Fed's trying to do to combat this inflation and the growth of the economy, um, you can see they're moving very aggressively. But this is, uh, we're taking advantage of using some of these instruments, shorter term treasuries, three month treasuries in our case. Uh, you know, you can get a, a good yield somewhere around, I think it's four and a half right now for uh, a 90 day treasury bond. But um, uh, that's not healthy, right? You want to, you, you want the, you want this to, re to reverse where you're getting more interest in the longer term than in the short term. I hope that makes sense. All right, I'm stopping my share. All right, so that was the end of the year. So now what's happening so far this year? Zoom out so I can see. So year to date, January, as of January 6th, the market's up slightly. Now, um, we took a bit of a downturn yesterday. Uh, it looks like we're down slightly today right now. But um, at, as of the end of the week, last week, markets were up 1.5%. Dow Jones Industrial Average was up 1.5%. The S&P 500 was up 1.47%. The NASDAQ was up 1.01 uh, across the board. 2.7 for the MSCI World Index, 3.39 uh, for the emerging markets. So everything's looking, looking positive so far this year. The bond markets, the one that I've been really blowing up throughout the year, um, is is up uh, 1.85, still down 10.27 percent um, uh, year over year. But all the bond indexes are um, are up um, so far this year in the first six days of the year. So we'll see where we end up. Uh, not a lot of change. What I'm looking at with the interest rates, so nothing really new to report there. All right. So what are the folks saying about this? So BlackRock had an interesting take, as they all typically do, uh, and I'll just read this to you. So um, there, there is a multi-page report, but I really liked what they said with their bottom line, and I'll try to decipher some of the, um, you know, the, the financial speak. So 2022 was a year of soaring inflation, rapid rate heights, and pandemic-induced lockdowns in China. We see volatility ahead in 2023, but expect the year to be shaped by big shifts from last year. Recessions in developed markets inflation falling and central banks so the fed not not just the us fed but fed like organizations throughout the world pausing their rate hikes um we'll see about that uh and china reopening will uh, likely turn more positive on risk assets at, at risk so so stock assets um after gauging what's in the price and market risk sediment a central theme of our new investment playbook so we'll see what uh, BlackRock has to say. Um, the other one that I thought was interesting this week was, um, uh, I think I've told you, I really find myself chuckling at the person who writes for Empower now, uh, used to be Prudential. Um, 
And this person's writing about the Federal Reserve. Uh, they said it's almost never possible for the Fed to say exactly what's on its mind because it's it'll affect you know the markets, the economy, everything. Um, but um, they said if you if you uh, look at the bottom of page nine of the Fed minutes, uh, there's a there's a phrase that says an unwarranted easing in financial conditions, especially if driven by a mis misperception by the public of the committee's reaction function, would complicate the committee's efforts to restore price stability. So you hear a lot about this soft landing. And what what uh, what I thought was interesting about this author's um, take on this is that they're saying the Fed is basically saying here we're trying to orchestrate a soft landing, but every time we talk about slowing down or easing, then you all uh, the the cause the stock market you all being us right the consumers and investors cause the stock market to um, to rally, and that makes us then say well wait a minute and the economy. Then that makes us say, well, wait a minute, maybe we should continue type, uh, tightening. So I thought that was, um, uh, I thought that was an interesting take. Take, and he goes on to say that sounds a little bit like Powell and Company. Obviously, Powell is the chairman of the Federal Reserve, chastising the stock market for rallying, rallying so hard during the fourth quarter of 2022. Uh, the last sentence, he says, the uh, FOMC is paying close attention to what the market is doing, and they don't really like it all that much. So that's an interesting take on it. Um, there are really the two analysts that I found interesting this week. So um, so that will be that. Okay, uh, let's jump into financial planning. Let me just see if there's any questions here. All right, and if you're just joining us on YouTube um, for this section, be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification button so you make sure that you get um, notifications whenever we upload a new video or when we're doing live feeds like we do every Tuesday morning at this time. All right, so I told you that um, on the Secure Act the 2.0 that came out right at the end of the year, and it, you know this was attached to the uh, spending bill that uh, Congress needed to pass to keep the government working. Um, there's over 100 retirement and financial related changes. So what are the big ones? To me, and we're going to talk more about this next week. We're going to devote a whole section of a whole webinar, you know, 30 minutes or so to Secure Act updates. Roth, Roth, Roth. There's a lot of discussion about Roths, and it's very, very positive. You know, I hear folks often say, well, what if Congress decides to get rid of Roth IRAs? Or what if they decide to tax Roth IRAs? Well, the first thing we are shown time and time again that um, Congress doesn't want to get rid of Roth IRAs. And in fact, they want to uh, encourage and require Roth IRA contributions. You might remember that during the, um, the first, I think I'm remembering it right, during the first iteration of this bill, the SECURE Act, um, it might have even been during the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, but in previous legislation, there was discussion about requiring the majority of your contributions in your retirement plans to go to a Roth account and limiting the amount that you could put into a traditional 401k. Um, so this is that's that's just one example. And Congress wants that money, that tax revenue that's created by doing Roth contributions and Roth conversions. So they they like Roth IRAs. Now, the second part of that question, could Congress ever uh, tax Roth IRAs? Well, I guess technically Congress could do whatever they want to do. But um, nothing has happened like that historically. And um, if, if anything, they could say from here on out, we're going to abandon Roth IRAs. And, uh, you know, it, it become, you know, there's no more um, tax free growth in accounts. And the folks that have done all the work to save money into Roth IRAs, convert into Roth IRAs, you would be what's called grandfathered in, in my opinion, just like what's happened in the past when they've rewritten rules about life insurance policies and taxation of distributions from life insurance policies. So the people who had them before were, were grandfathered under the old rules, uh, and that's typically how it works. There are new RMD requirements. We're going to talk about that. Um, RMDs are pushed back for some so um, that's not everybody. So the, uh, the this is a big point because, you know, we're going to get questions of people who had to take RMDs in 2022 because they turned age 72. And now they read that it's not um, it's age 73. So, you know, do did I have to take it in 2022? And is there a way to get it back? And, you know, the, we get these crazy questions from people. But let's it, it all starts here and then goes forward. There's no looking back. 
Um, first of all, uh, that I, that I say that because that question actually came up. But very simply, if you were born in 1950 or earlier, there's no changes. There are no changes to your RMD rules. You follow the same rules. If you're born from 1951 to 1958, your required minimum distribution begins at age 73. So your, your required beginning date is April 1st of the year following the year you, you turn 73, but you've, it's, they're the same kind of rules. It's just that your age is increased and it's only for those born from 1951 to 1958. And listen, folks, I say this all the time. Congress doesn't make these rules easier. I thought it was confusing before, and I used to talk about how they make things confusing with ages like 70 and a half and 59 and a half, but my goodness, at least they were constant. Now it's, well, if you were born 1950 or earlier, no changes. If you're born in this seven-year window, well, it's, it's age 73. If you're born after 59, age 59, or excuse me, 1959, your RMDs don't begin until age 75. So this is all great, and it gives a lot of planning flexibility. And I, as a financial planner, I love that. Um, but it certainly makes our job more challenging as far as educating consumers. It's easier for us to go through and say, these are the rules. Um, this is how it applies. But uh, consumers make mistakes all the time. Institutions make mistakes, too. It's not just you folks. It's also the big firms. We see it all the time. Um, so uh, be careful about that. So there are the new RMD rules, very, very simply, from 1950 or earlier, if you're born in 1950 or earlier, no changes. From 1951 to 1958, your new RMD age is age 73. So if you get a grace period for this year, next year, whatever, hallelujah, good for you. Of course, you can still take the money out if you want to, but you're not required to. If you're born in 1959 or later, your RMD now begins at age 75 under this legislation. So good changes there, but more confusion. The penalty for the missed RMD is reduced from 50%. Remember, the penalty for a missed RMD for many, 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 many years was 50% of what you should have taken if you didn't take that RMD. So if you owed, if you were supposed to take $30,000 out as, as an RMD and you failed to do that, the penalty was technically $15,000. Well, that now is reduced to 25%. So they cut it in half. Well, that's a good thing. And it could also be. 10%. So what's the, uh, what's the, the, why could it be? There's a phrase that they use says timely. So if you correct it in a timely manner, then they'll reduce uh, the penalty to 10%. Here's the big secret on this one. Hardly anybody paid that 50% penalty. It would have to be egregious. Most people, if they made a mistake, they didn't take their RMD. They, if you take your distribution immediately, if you file the correct paperwork, most of the time, that fee was waived. Uh, only once in my entire 20 some years now, oh my goodness, 20, 22 years, coming up on 22 years um, doing this, did I ever see anybody pay a penalty? And frankly, they didn't have to. They just decided that, well, actually their accountant decided that it was the right thing to do or it was the wrong thing to do. They didn't even ask for relief. But um, in this case, uh, they're reducing the, the, the penalty by half and maybe even 10%, but my guess is they're going to be applying it more. So it's going to create more revenue, probably for the revenue uh, and internal revenue service and, and for the country, uh, because I think it's going to be less forgiven. I don't have any numbers to back that up. That's just my thought. It'd be interesting to see, you know, five years from now, looking at the RMD penalty, penalties compared to what they are in 2028 collectively. So Roth, 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 here we go. RMDs and Roth retirement plans are eliminated. I wish I could do fireworks coming off of here. That's a big one. Um, you know, this has always been uh, uh, an area of frustration and an area of misunderstanding of people. We all know that there are no required minimum distributions from your own Roth IRAs. If you pass them to your heirs, then there are. But we're talking about what you own. Roth IRAs, no RMDs. Roth 401ks, Roth 403bs. There, there were required minimum distributions. When you turned your age of required minimum distribution, you had to take distributions. Now they weren't taxed, but they still were required. So, um, so this is great. It gives more flexibility. You can keep your money in a retirement plan if it makes sense. You can roll it over to a Roth IRA if it makes sense. Uh, it's good. It, but, but 
more importantly than anything, it just makes the rules a little more cohesive uh, and a little less confusing for people. So that's a big one. SEP and simple plans can allow Roth contributions. That's another big one. So these are SEP and simple plans are for typically for smaller companies. SEPs can be a really good um, option for just one owner companies, or maybe if it's you and your spouse. Simple plans, in my opinion, are a complete nightmare. They're a pain in the neck to deal with. Nobody should be dealing with simple plans when you can do your, your own 401ks very easily these days. But they're, they become a little bit better because they can now have Roth contributions where they couldn't in the past. So that's another big one. This is, this is an interesting one. Mandatory. This is why I, I listed this because, you know, Congress is pushing people now into Roth IRA or Roth 401ks. So there's a mandatory Roth catch-up contribution. So everybody knows that you can, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a flat amount that, that you can contribute up to um, for retirement plans. And then if you're over 50, you can contribute more. Or if you're over 50 and your income is greater than $145,000, you must put that catch-up contribution into your Roth option, into your retirement plan. So that's actually going to be interesting as I'm thinking about that, because most retirement plans have a Roth option now, but not all. So I wonder if this requirement here is going to force these dinosaur plans that haven't yet adopted a Roth option into adopting a Roth option. So I hadn't thought about that until just now. Employer contributions can now be made into the Roth. In, um, in previous years, we've always taught that you can put 100% of your contributions into your Roth plan if you have a plan. I'm talking about retirement plans, 401ks, 403bs, et cetera. But your employer must contribute to the tax deferred bucket of that retirement plan. Now, the employer contributions can be made to the Roth. So it's probably going to take a little while to figure out the logistics of that. You're, of course, going to have to pay tax on that money where you weren't paying tax before, but it's going to be your money forever and any growth is going to be tax free um, going forward. So that's another big one for, for that employer match or the employer contributions can equal a lot of money every year for, uh, for people. Uh, there is another provision to roll over some 529 funds to, to Roth if you don't need them for college. Um, so one of the drawbacks about 529 plans is that you can use them for a lot of different things, but if you don't use them for higher education or now even for um, uh, high school, private schools, things like that, um, then you're kind of stuck with that money and you can do things, you can pass it on to the next generation. But now you're also allowed to roll that money into a Roth. Now there are limitations. There are a lot of limitations on this. There are requirements and limitations that you've got to be aware of, but that is a really, really great and freeing topic or a concept for, um, or allowance, I'll say, for uh, 529s. And it'll probably um, uh, convince people to invest more into 529 plans. So that's good. Way to go, Congress. What's not included in here? Positives that are not included. I didn't write one thing in here, but the positives from a Roth, Roth, Roth point of view that's not included is that there are no limitations on Roth conversions. That has not changed. So a lot of people were saying, oh, they're going to get rid of Roth conversions. They're going to put limitations on Roth conversions. And there was discussion about, well, if you earn a certain amount, then you are going to have uh, a limit on um, conversions. There is no limitation. If you earn a billion dollars a year and want to convert a billion dollars from your IRA to your Roth IRA, you can do it. Um, so that's good. Little or as much as you'd like. Uh, so the second, no elimination of backdoor Roth contributions. So some of us like to do backdoor Roth contributions. And to be very, very careful because of the pro rata rules, but you can contribute a non-deductible contribution into your traditional IRA, immediately can convert it to a Roth IRA. And if you do it right, you don't pay any tax on that. Well, you pay, you know, it's after tax money. Um, you got to be careful. Don't wait too long in between. I'm not going to get into the details, but there's no change, no elimination of the backdoor Roth IRA. And I'll add one negative. So those are both positives, right? So that's a positive. That's a positive. I'll add one negative here. Um, and that is the Roth conversion date. If I could have changed one bit of legislation here, if I could have added something, we all know that you can make contributions to your uh, traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, up to your tax filing deadline, which I think is April 17th of this year. 
Why in the world can't we do a conversion up till the tax filing deadline? It would make things so much easier because it is a huge guessing game from September, uh, you know, whenever you do your conversion. It's a huge guessing game. Typically for us, it's uh, September, October, November, December. So that whole end of the year, you're just trying to kind of figure out where people are going to be. And then you have uh, you have all kinds of, you know, tax reporting that's not in yet. It's It's just such a bad system. So unfortunately, they didn't change that. That is still 1231 of the year. Um, so that stinks. So I'm going to start having some serious conversations with my congressman to see if somehow uh, we can start having conversations about uh, putting this into some future legislation. But my goodness, um, it just seems so simple. I don't even know why they wouldn't do it. Um, more people would convert. They'd convert more money because uh, we often leave a gap for folks just in case. Well, if we can close that gap, that means more tax dollars for people. All right, so that is the webinar for today. We're a little over. It's 1050. It was great to see you all. I missed you all. I'm happy to see you. If you need anything from us, please reach out. If you need to schedule an appointment, um, uh, please either you can email, them at, at, email us at admin at outofourwealth.com or call us at 215-310-9440, and we'll be sure to schedule time for you. If you're a client, you need to see us, if it's something urgent, please reach out to us right away, and we'll get you on the, the calendar. Great seeing you all, and uh, have a great rest of your week. Take care.